I mean, if you got a Bible, I hope you do. Joshua chapter 7 is where we're going to be. And so uh, open it up. If you forgot your Bible, act like you knew that and pull out your phone. <laughs> Joshua chapter 7. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to jump in. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about the nature of warfare. Um, and I want to I want to be uh, as succinct as possible because of time, and we're going to end with a conversation with two men who are very familiar with spiritual warfare and how they've uh, combated it, but I want to speak as plainly to you as possible and as seriously as possible, because where we're going is not for wimps, where we're going is not for cowards, and where we're going is not a place uh, for men who don't know how to get their sword out, okay? And so I want, I want to speak as plainly as I can, because it's going to be the men in this house and the men in this room um, that know how to do warfare, that will lead our house into, um, I believe, the plans that God has for us in the future. So let's pray and we'll jump in together. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would um, help us think clearly and help us to think biblically and help us to think with the help of the Spirit about what it means to follow you into the, onto the field of battle and to survive. And then not only survive, um, but to gain great victories for your name, for Jesus' sake, to not be a liability on the field, but to be an asset on the field. That's what we're hoping for and asking for your help this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A couple talking points for us to begin our time. Number one, God versus government. History has proven this is the story of the world. Uh, and this isn't the church being political, this is us being biblical. I am just... I'm going to speak plainly. I am, I, am, I am sick up to my eyeballs with Christians and leaders and pastors who are saying it's not that the church shouldn't be political. Then you can't go outside and be a Christian because that's, it's, politics are everywhere. And this is the story of history. This is Moses against Egypt. This is Esther against Persia. This is Daniel against Babylon. This is Jesus and Paul and Peter and the Christians against Rome. Like, 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 this is what it is. How does it work? Our Father has all dominion of the earth. He rules and reigns over all things. And then He made you as a man, and He delegated to you dominion. He's given you delegated dominion over your sexuality, over your home as a husband, over your wife, over your children, and as God's man, he's given you both the ability, permission, and authority to exercise authority and dominion over those areas of responsibility. Here's what spiritual warfare is. It's a question of dominion. If you don't exercise spiritual authority over your sexuality and over your wife and over your marriage and over your children and over their education and over your household, Satan will. Full stop. So if you're not in the game over those areas in your life, Satan will be. Dominion surrender equals government empowered. When we surrender dominion over those areas of our life, Satan takes that authority and then he runs right to the government and he exercises dominion over that area through the government. That's how it works throughout history. That's how it works throughout the Bible. I was on a mountain bike ride with my brother on Monday trying to recover from the mind meld of, of Monday so, or Sunday so I didn't lose my mind and get a little fresh air. And my brother said, you know what hit me about all the Mission Impossible movies and all the James Bond movies and all the Jason Bourne movies and all the other action heroes that have JB as their initials that we all love and spend money for? And I said, what? He said, it's all about them against a rogue government trying to take over the world. That's crazy. You know why that sells tickets? Because that's the story that we're in. That's been selling tickets since Genesis chapter 1. So the government comes along and says, we're going to exercise dominion over your sexuality. We're going to exercise dominion over your wife. We're going to exercise dominion over the education of your children. We're going to exercise dominion over your household. And civil disobedience today in our time right now looks like you merely being a responsible man. No. You can't vaccinate my children. No, you can't castrate my children. No, you can't indoctrinate my children. This is war, and they're coming to your house. That's my opening talking points. Joshua chapter 7. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, 
the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Haven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. <laughs> That's crazy. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army. For only a few people live there. So about three thousand men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai. <laughs> that is crazy. Who called about 36... Who killed about 36 of them? They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the heart of the people melted in fear and became like water. Quick backstory, God has told them to go into the promised land, which is equivalent and the same as battleground. Remember that? So when we hear God's promised land, we need to hear battleground because it was full of enemy uh, 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 encampments. And so to homestead the promised land, they had to get their battle game on. They've crossed the Jordan. They've routed Jericho, not through military might, but through uh, faith in God as they marched around and sang like a bunch of wild men. And then God gives them a victory, and all of a sudden they're like, we can mail this one in. This would be the danger of where we're at as a church. Look at all God's been able to do through us, and then we mail it in tomorrow. Friends, t- today is the first day of the rest of our life at Grace City Church, no mailing it in. We dig deeper than ever before. We read more, study more, pray more. We're more vigilant. We're more generous. We dig deeper now than we ever had before. If we rely on and presume upon the faithfulness of God in a way that, um, how should I say it? Um, Presumes on his grace, thinking he owes us something. I don't want to be a part of that church because God's spirit can lift, as we'll see here in a moment. God's spirit can lift. And you could be the reason that God's Spirit lifts. Verse 6, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Isn't that crazy? If only we had been content to disobey God by following him into the promised land. God didn't give them a vote, and they're like, yeah, let's go. He's like, this is where I'm going to take you. This is what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to accomplish. There's the bridge. Start marching. And now they're like, it would have been better had we not obeyed God than got over here and, and, were, and were made to look like saps. I, I, I would criticize Joshua if only for the fact that, that I've had those very thoughts. It had better if I just stayed real estate. Wouldn't have got shot at, wouldn't have got lied about, wouldn't have got smeared all over my town. It would have just been easier, more comfortable. My family wouldn't get shot at. My family wouldn't be under spiritual attack. Life would be easier. I'd go from 70-hour weeks to 50-hour weeks and, and, and have brown hair instead of gray hair and live probably 10 years longer. I have, I've had all those thoughts. But I didn't have a choice. God said, do this, and then I'm going to do this and buckle up. This hasn't been like some like, you know, ambitious drive of Josh. This has been just simple obedience as God leads. And here we are, men, the men of Grace City Church, on the precipice of what I believe is the greatest spiritual battle we're ever going to go into. And we're going to be leading the church because where we're going is going to be the front line battle for the church in our generation, I believe. Joshua says this, pardon your servant, Lord, but just that, that, that's his self-conscious way to say, I know I shouldn't be thinking or saying this, but here we are, so I'm going to say it. What can I say now that Israelites have been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. And you got to read that right. I don't think it's like, stand up. It's like, stand up. Like, get up. Stop whining, stop griping, stop complaining. Get up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. What's God saying? I'm not the reason you lost. You are. 
Get up. You're here because of sin in the camp. You're not here because I ran out of juice to win the, beat the bad guys. You're here because there's sin in the camp. You're here because there's a Benedict Arnold in the camp. You're here because the things that were to be devoted to me got kept and mixed with your own possessions. This is why you've become cowards. Verse 13. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in the preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Devoted things being this. They had plundered. If you look back to chapter 4, they had taken Jericho. And God said, none of these riches are for you. You devote them to the Lord. You, you put them on the altar and you sacrifice them to the Lord. And someone took that which was God's and mixed it within their, among their own possessions and took it for themselves. This is, this is a strong word for, for the few men among us that struggle with greed, which is every guy I'm looking at right now. <laughs> Verse 14, In the morning, present yourself before the tribe. The tribe of the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Anybody uncomfortable yet? Whoever is caught with a devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua was up, had Israel before the, uh, come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. Can you imagine if you're Achan right now? I want you to imagine being Achan. Yeah, yeah, you're like, look at all this, this treasure. No one's going to miss if I just keep a little for myself. And so he, he, he successfully hides it from all the eyes watching him, tucks it into, like, like, honestly, this is the stupidity of covetousness and greed. What is Achan going to do with a bar of gold in the desert? <laughs> I thought about this last night. It's like, like what an idiot. What's he going to do with that? There's no pawn shop he can take it to and swap it out for something cool. He's just going to carry it around and it's going to make his life more miserable. That's what you do with your greed. That's what you do with selfishness and materialism. You keep things for yourself, thinking it'll make you happier, and it's you carrying a bar of gold around the desert. Imagine when he's like, well, what's going on? Someone's kept devoted things, and we're going to find out who they are, and we're going we're to sacrifice them to God. And he's like, he's like, well, I think I've covered my tracks. I, I dusted the gold bar of fingerprints. They won't find me. Here's how we're going to do it. God's going to expose you. Well, crap. <laughs> the clans of Judah came forward, and the Zeharites were chosen. He's like, oh, man. He had the clan of the Zeharites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. He's like, crap. Joshua had the Zimri family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to God, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylon, Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent, with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. This is totally a, a, a stronger man text, because you never preach this on it. I googled Joshua 7. Nobody preaches on it, because of verse 24. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, and the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkey, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, like his toothbrush, like we're going to purify the camp here, to the valley of Achar. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest, which is his family, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rock, which remained to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger, therefore that place had been, has been called the Valley of Achar ever since. A couple of things to learn from us, for, for us from Achan. Number one, God doesn't mess around with sin, neither should you. 
God doesn't mess around with sin, neither should you. You're like, well, this is the New Testament day, the day of grace. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he is the consuming fire whose eyes burn with a holy jealousy for his people. And if you claim his name and you mess around with sin, there will be consequences. And if you think, well, Jesus will forgive me, and yet you pursue long enough in that sin, you demonstrate that you're not in Christ, you're, you're, you're in your flesh, and you don't want to die there. Because the redeemed, forgiven Son of God does not persist in perpetual sin. He's increasingly gaining victory over that sin. I'm not saying you don't struggle. I'm not saying you don't feel like, no, 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 there's a lot of room for that. You know that. You know me. You know that we love grace here. But, but, but I, I want it to be a strong word for those of you here who, are per, who have a perpetuating sin that, you, that is buried under your tent. God will expose you. And brother, if you're not in Christ, you will be punished with death, the same punishment we saw here. God doesn't mess around with sin, neither should you. This is a means of grace this morning for every man who calls grace to church home to, I almost entitled this, um, I won't say what else, I almost entitled it, but get your act together. Get your crap together. Okay? G-Y star T. Get your crap together. Number two, sin is never private. Individual actions can jeopardize the whole camp, including your family. That's a powerful lesson. Achan sins in private, and his consequences ripple through every living generation of his family. They're dead. They, they, they probably didn't even know it. They're like, Dad, where are we going? What's with the gold? Dad, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Sorry, son. I mean, can you imagine the conversation in the last minutes of their life as they're being stoned to death by the people of God? This, this is a sobering moment. Son, I'm sorry. Dad, it hurts. Dad, dad. And the man that was supposed to protect them had turned that dominion over to Satan when he acted in the flesh, when he exercised greed and materialism and selfishness. He exposed his family to the wrath of God. This is a sober, you should go to work sober this morning. Well, what's the deal? Are you sad this morning? Nope, I'm just considering, I'm just considering the consequences of my sin in life and my children. I'm just considering the consequences of if I choose to ding around with, with, with sin, what it'll cost my kids. If you turn the dominion over your family that God gave you, Satan picks it up, and then he abuses them the rest of their life. Number three, covetousness will kill you. Don't hoard for yourself what's rightfully God's. Fight covetousness with generosity. What's rightfully God's that you have in your life? Everything. Every dollar, every penny, every asset, every investment, every idea, every portfolio, every account, every child, everything that you have that God's given you as a man. Thanks be to God for his grace to you. And don't pretend or think it's yours. It's God. You can, you can commit the sin of Achan with a child. Oh, this one's mine. You can consit, commit the sin of Achan with your checkbook, with your cryptocurrency, with your, with your little side hustle investment, you know, that you do with your stock portfolio. Well, let's not think the sin of Achan is for those guys that go steal gold bars. The sin of Achan is also for those men who hold back from God that which is his which is why we do resource initiatives, which is why we tackle and climb huge hills, which is why we set out to do things we couldn't do in our own power and our own strength, because we need God to provide. And people often ask me, I've talked to pastors, and I, I said, do you ever do resource initiatives? Like, no, why not? Because if I asked people to give, they'd leave. I'd say, well, remind me not to go to your church. I call you men to give sacrificially and joyfully because that's what I have to do to keep my soul saved. I got a regularly, daily, monthly, yearly. We flushed our savings account down to zero four different times to keep this church on its, on its legs. And I've never been more provided for in my life. I've never had more resources at my, my, my uh, disposal. I've never been more taken care of in this moment right now. And I've given away more times than I can count. And I do it because I need to remind myself who I worship. And it's God, not money. And as a lead pastor of this church, I can be tempted to turn my trust over to money this afternoon. And so for my soul, I lead in such a way as to keep me on the straight and narrow, which is to stay aggressively pursuing God. 
pick the biggest enemy target I can find and run at it as hard as I can. That's how I keep my soul saved. That's how I keep my soul in need of God. How does the word of God stay precious to me? I go into the heat of battle and realize I need it. That's how the word of God stays precious to me. When I opened the word of God this past week, as our family was under a spiritual warfare, from all attacks on every side, and read five different passages to my children with tears in my eyes as they soberly listened, the word of God was sweet. The word of God isn't sweet in the, in, in, in the, in, in the, in the peaceful plains. The word of God is sweet in the field of battle. You need to be in the field of battle with your family, with your kids, with your life, with your career, with everything God's given you. Otherwise, this will be boring and inconvenient and much less entertaining than Netflix. But when you're in the heat of battle, you need this more than you need air. Number four, God won't bless a divided house, so don't be the weak link. In these days, as we're moving into this this. We're stepping into the gap. We're going into the breach for families, for children, for men, for women, for, for future generations, for grandkids. As we're doing that, God won't bless a divided house, which means more than anything, we need to ensure that our hearts are unified around the gospel, unified around mission. Don't be the weak link. Your sin could cause the whole thing to go down. Isn't that encouraging? So I'm going to give you... Uh, like 14 spiritual warfare principles. I'm going to try to keep myself to 30 seconds of principle. You probably can't write it down as fast as I'm going to go. You can take a picture of it you like, and I'm going to bring some men up that I have learned from as I've observed their life uh, up close for many, many years in relationship to the link between spiritual warfare and generosity. Number one, small things are big things, so pay attention and stay vigilant. On the phone last night with Adam, I said, if you could tell the men one thing about spiritual warfare, what would you tell them? And he said, I would tell them small things are big things. And I agree with him. When you are in enemy territory, everything means something. Don't miss it. Pay attention. Stay vigilant. So I'm just telling you, we are, we are, we are thoroughly, deeply, completely behind enemy lines. So when, you, when, when you're behind enemy lines you act differently than if you were back at, at the forward operating base. Because back at base, you play cards, and you Zoom your, your kids, and you joke around with the guys. When you're behind enemy lines, it's get your crap together time. And there's a vigilance that you have there that you don't have when you're back home. Gentlemen, we are, as individual Christians, and most certainly as a church, behind enemy lines. Pay attention. Amen. Number two, being unified beats being right. Prioritize relationships. If you're divided at home with your wife, men, fix it. Do whatever it takes. Fix it. And it will probably take you humbling yourself. Because that's what it takes when I'm out of sorts. Rarely is Sharon wrong. So frustrating. <laughs> if we're divided, if, if, we have, if we have a disagreement... And my, and my spirit is free, and my mind is clear, and I'm leading in an issue in, in humility, she rarely bucks me. She, she all, boom, we're there. If we're in disagreement, it's, it's because, it's because I, there's something in my heart and my spirit that's off. So prioritize relationships with your spouse, with your children. I, I, we've, we told, so this is my week. Preach five times Sunday talking to you right now, preach tomorrow, uh, have a lot of big meetings on Friday, open the women's conference with almost 800 women on Saturday that you all should be praying for, which is remarkable, preach twice Sunday, help lead the Silver Saints prayer meeting Sunday night, and then teach a three-hour class on, on, on Lifetrack University uh, at Life about the school and where we're going in our culture in this day to make battle on the enemy. Been a full week, at the end of a full month, at the end of a full summer, at the end of a full year. So I tell my kids, Hey, when things run hot, the hotter they get, the cooler we ride. Let's go. So we buckle down. So it's in these times that, that are difficult and challenging that we're never better as a family. We're praying together, encouraging one another, prioritizing relationships. I drove home from a riding retreat, burned 12 hours to a cabin and back within the last two weeks to prioritize getting a relationship fixed that was out of whack. Because I can't have division in my relational world when I'm behind enemy lines. Gentlemen, prioritize your relationships. Number three, 
Every man is, is a gate. Keep your attitude locked down. As I was preparing to leave on this ride retreat a couple weeks ago, I gathered my family. I said, okay, kids, I'm gone, and we're in the middle of it. And so while I'm gone, there will not be a gap in spiritual authority. I'm going to be praying over you, and Mom will be leading our home under my authority. And Levi, I expect you to be in prayer. You walk the perimeter every night physically. You walk the perimeter spiritually every morning when you wake up in prayer. LMA, Amelia, I looked at each kid, and I gave them a little, a, a little instruction. I said, here's the deal. We are a, our, 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 our city, and this city is, is, is we defend this city with, with our actions. And each one of you are a gate. And Gideon, if you decide to act selfishly, and Levi, if you decide to act selfishly, and Amelia, if you decide to act selfishly, and LMA, if you decide to act selfishly, if you decide to act out attitudes of the flesh, that's opening the gate to the enemy, and now the enemy is inside our camp wreaking havoc on everybody. So my encouragement to you is you keep the gate closed. You keep your attitudes like Christ. You walk in the Spirit. You stay humble. You do spiritual warfare by being like Jesus, and you ask him for Jesus' help. If, if your attitude goes sideways, the gate is open, and the whole Mac camp is exposed. Copy that, Dad. We pray. They lock it down. I take off. I come back a day and a half early, uh, surprising them because of some things I had to take care of to make sure relational unity stayed strong in this camp. And I walked in, and my home was a home of peace. They were laughing. Worship music was on, encouraging one another. They kept the camp locked down. You need to lead your family in such a way that keeps your household locked down because there's some of you have households with gates open. Your gate's open. Your wife's gate's open. Your kid's gate's open. They're, don't miss this opportunity, man, to pull your kids into the battle. They'll be better for it. Four, the easily offended are easily taken out. Be unoffendable. If you're easily offended, you won't last long on God's team. You have to just refuse to be offended. Those who are easily offended quickly become tools of the enemy wherever they're at inside the church. Number five, the proud die young. Embrace humility. You got that? Good. Six, no middle ground. Check your colors. I'm shocked and dismayed at the amount of Christians who align themselves with the enemy and then shoot at other Christians. And you think you're being humble, you think you're being godly, but in actuality, you're just acting out an offense. You're acting out of jealousy. You're acting out of this feels good to, to take out someone I don't like. And you align with the enemy to take out the bride of Christ. Friends, Jesus will not look kindly on those who claim his name and shot at his bride. So, so, so you better check your colors and make sure you know what team you're on. Number seven, don't chase the bait. Reject gossip and hearsay. You are watch the movie We Were Soldiers? They land on the battlefield, overzealous sergeant, a platoon leader. Oh, let's go chase that guy. And they're like, crap, oh man. And he leads his whole platoon out into the brush. It's an ambush. They circle them, murder, kill almost all of them, and it becomes the, the focus of the rest of the battle to get those guys back. How you chase the bait is, is, is you listen to gossip and you listen to hearsay. You have to shut that stuff off because that's the first place Satan's going to go to get you disrupted and get you divided. And I'll, and, and, and I'll say this as carefully as I can. I don't say things as carefully as I can in the morning as I do in the afternoon when, when my brain's awake. So I'll wake up about 10 o'clock and go, man, what did I say? You keep the door shut with your wife because the, because the sin that women are prone to in a week of frame is gossip, slander, and hearsay. You lock that garbage down. You don't sit there and listen to it like a gutless, nutless Ahab. You shut it down. You cut it off. Babe, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to go there. What, and, and, and she's going to start chewing on you. Men, stand up and shut it down. Women can destroy a community, they can destroy a church, they can destroy families, and men can too. We got our stuff. This is me picking on ladies. But they're, 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 the sin they're prone to most often is this. I talk to so-and-so, I talk to so-and-so. We can small mind talk about people, great minds talk about ideas. Stop allowing the conversation to other people just to float through your home. Shut it down. That sin will bite you and bite your household. Number eight. Unforgiveness is kryptonite. Keep short accounts. If you have an unforgiving spirit, that will weaken your ability to be strong in the spiritual realm. Assumptions are landmines. Over-communicate. Well, I thought, well, you said, well, I figured, no, no, no. 
Don't make assumptions. Always over commit. I love us with my team. I get three texts, just triple checking. I never resent that. I love that Ryan McKelvey is an over communicator. Just double checking. Before I send this email, we good? I'm like, I'm good. I never resent an extra phone call, text message, or email. We over communicate as a team because assumptions are landmines in business and in your relationships. Well, honey, I thought, no, no, clarify with your wife, man. I thought you were going to take, I thought you were going to talk to, no, no, you take initiative. 10, godliness is a superpower, walk in the spirit. <laughs> godliness is a superpower, walk in the spirit. Read the fruits of the spirit, Galatians, get the book out of Galatians out, blow the dust off your Bible, read it again, and go, God, give me that spirit. God, give me, help me be that kind of man, that Jesus-like kind of man that responds to conflict and attack and the temptation of gossip, slander, hearsay in the power of the spirit, because that is a superpower to defeat the enemy. Number 11, propaganda kills the fighting spirit. Tune out the enemy's channel. Tokyo Rose was being broadcast all over the, the Pacific Theater during World War II to defeat the spirits of the men. Do you know who it was? An American woman appealing to the men to go home because their bride probably sleeping with one of their best friends at this moment. And what was so de defeating about her was that she was supposed to be one of us. The enemy is going to come at you with other Christians. The enemy is going to come at you with their defeatist propaganda, and you got to tune it out. Maybe you got to cut off a relationship. Maybe you got to stop listening to so and so. Maybe you got to get off Facebook. Maybe you got to get off, whatever you got to do. Tune the enemy's propaganda out because what he'll try to do is to take the fight out of you. Number thirteen: misinformation divides. Refuse suspicion. Suspicion I should say yes. Yeah, suspicion and believe the best. Man, a group of men believing the best, refusing submission. Those are men that can take the field for Jesus and win. And lastly, platoons need leaders. Lock your family down. Lock your family down. I want to invite Greg and Jeff to come up to end our time together. The last one we'll end with is this. The flesh will rise. Kill it with the sword of generosity. Gentlemen, as we move into the battleground where God's taking us, your flesh is going to rise. And when the flesh rises, your temptation is to close your hand. You can grab a seat here, gentlemen. And my encouragement to you is, as we go into battle, to open your hand. And one of the, one of the primary ways that I fight the, the enemy and my flesh is to stay generous with everything that I have. I find that my generosity quotient is directly connected to my spiritual thriving and my spiritual courage. And so, so you need to find ways with whatever God's given you, whatever the mind he's given you, the creativity he's given you, the businesses he's given you, the dollars he's given you, where you have a million dollars in the bank or you have a hundred dollars in the bank. And that's not what this is about. This is about you being generous with whatever you have. That will keep your heart sharp in the face of spiritual warfare. So God's men, don't sit, gripe, whine, cower, or take. If you've been sitting or griping or whining or cowering or taking, stop it. What God's men do is they discern the times they're in. They dream about all God might have them do as they fight to give and to build to the glory of God. That's what, that's what God's men do. They discern, they dream, they fight, they give, and they build. They are always found doing those things in some area of their life one way or another. I'm discerning the times that we're in. I'm discerning my own heart and the sin that so easily arises. I'm dreaming about big things that God might use me to do in these days. I'm in the fight, not against my wife, but with my wife. Not, not, oh, not against my kids, but, but with my children and over my children. I'm giving all that I have all the time, and I'm not sitting around wishing someone else would do something. I'm actively engaged in building something better than the world has to offer. So be fruitful is this. We're going to try to do three things, and they're all crazy. We're going to try to build Grace Kids Town to make this place the family capital of the world because we need to serve more families. There are young families with young children having no clue what to do, and they need a place they can call home, and we are out of space. We've got to grow this campus so more families can meet Jesus. Secondly, we're going to start Garden City Academy, which is equally insane. It's totally insane. Our operating budget for this year will be just under $5 million. When Anti School District will spend $127 million in the next 10 months. Eastmont, Wenatchee, Kashmir, Cascade School Districts will spend $327 million in the next 10 months. And they're going, to, they're going to be taking money from the Google plant I drove by yesterday, a couple hundred million bucks a year. We're taking donations in ones and fives. This is impossible. What we're trying to do is crazy. Our families and children are worth it. 
Gray City, Rome. We're going to plant the warrior poet because that sounds like fun. <laughs> that, that guy needs to be unleashed. And so we're, we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, you know, go get him, John. <laughs> this is how we're organizing ourselves to pick the biggest enemy targets we can and run headlong toward them with the name of Jesus on our lips and the glory of God in our hearts. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And men, it flat out takes dollars. And that's how God's designed it on purpose to keep your heart tender to the things of God. So God's, this is God's design that we discern, dream, fight, give, and build. That's the goal. It's in this booklet. If you don't got it, if you weren't here uh, uh, for premiere night, you need to grab this on your way out so you can be informed as to the game plan that your church is employing to fight the enemy. You need to read every word in here and then prayerfully consider how you lead your family into it. Here's our, miracle, our faith goal I shared on Sunday. 10 million bucks as, as our faith goal, which is just crazy. $12 million is our miracle goal. If, if we don't hit that number, we don't get to do any of the things we're talking about. So this is like, oh, if we get seven, we'll be okay. No, nope, if we get seven, we'll give you a refund. And a start. I don't know what we're going to do. So but like, there's, no, I, there's no world where I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, this is a chip shot. This is borderline insane. And we believe it's obedient to what God's called us to do. That number was prayed over for a year and a half. So we're going to see what God's going to do. So you can give, whoops, let's go back to here. We'll go back to there. I want to talk to these men in our remaining moments about generosity and spiritual warfare. Jeff, how you doing? Good. Is this on? Hit the button there. Oh, they'll talk on it, yeah. Back? Okay, yeah. good. Um, without getting into too much of, of, of uh, your, your story, uh, tell us about your journey to, uh, to generosity and how you've seen God use it in your life in relationship to spiritual warfare and all things kingdom building. Yeah, I won't go too far back, but um, pre-Jesus is, is part of our story to generosity. So my wife, Becky, and I, um, we had an incredibly rough start to our marriage. I was not saved at the time. Becky was not saved at the time. And we started out in, it, with a brutal first, even three weeks. I moved my wife out of our house three weeks after we got back from our honeymoon. That's how bumpy and instantly rocky it was. The Lord um, was gracious and came and saved us out of our garbage and out of our sin. I was a terrible leader. I was not a stronger man. Um, we used money and licentiousness and comfort to fill the void that was there that Jesus, where Jesus wasn't at the time. Uh, again, God graciously saved us and saved us both, which was a, a real blessing. And we started um, wanting, we, we had this thankfulness for Jesus saving us. We had this thankfulness for him drawing us out of, our, out of our sin and out of our garbage. And out of that thankfulness, we started wanting to participate in giving. And we said, how can we give back? How can we, how can we be an effective servant of Christ? And I started to see these patterns of when we would get into trouble, it was because I was following the old patterns of where I would use my wallet. Hmm. And so I started making this connection between my wallet and our previous sin. Hmm. And the antidote to that for Becky and I was to redirect where we hmm. spent our money and where our affections were and where we took our wallet. And what we found is, is when we started sending and pushing our resources towards the kingdom, our heart followed that. And so the antidote for us for sanctification and, and growing up as a man was to begin to be generous. Mm -hmm. And so this light bulb went on about generosity in our home and how much we enjoyed it and how much, we, how much joy we got out of giving. And um, we, we're business owners. And I, I started seeing this disconnect between my spiritual life, my home life, and then my businesses. And, I, and, and we were wanting to give more, and we were wanting to do more, and, and I would go to work, and that light switch would kind of go off. And, and so it was like, there was a disconnect here. And so um, reading through 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15 was a real light bulb moment for me, and, and, and saying, you know, I think God's going to, God is behind us in our generosity. And so we said, what if we committed our business to the kingdom? What if we used what we have inside of our businesses to begin to that, that to begin to fund that leash that we were using to, to draw us in, into sanctification, which was our wallet. Um, and we began to commit business, business resources to the kingdom. And lo and behold, God got behind it. And it became a um, big surprise, right? Um, God gets behind your giving. And this light bulb went on and we said, you know, 
the world's version of flourishing and the world's version of prosperity is wrong. The world says, hold on to your stuff. The world says, keep your stuff. The world says, don't give it away. The path to wealth is to hold on to it. God says, give it away. Mm -hmm. That's the path. That's mm -hmm. the path to joy. That's the path to flourishing. And so we began to follow that. And we said, yeah. okay, Lord, we're going to start giving in faith. And when we did, and when we turned our businesses over to the kingdom, and when we started businesses for the kingdom, God just got behind it, and, and it became a real ministry for us. It's mm. a passion for us to want to be generous. And mm. God is incredibly faithful, men. When you step out in faith mm -hmm. and, and, and not giving to get or rubbing a magic genie bottle, but mm -hmm. when you step out in faith with your giving, He will be there with a safety net under you. He yeah. will cover the checks you write. We've seen it over and over and over. And so um, we just love being generous. And... and this stuff we're talking about, it's an opportunity to step up. It's an opportunity to show faith. Becky and I are committed, and uh, this school needs to happen, so we're, we're all in. Yeah. So tell us quick about Sp uh, Sparrow and the mission behind Sparrow. Okay, so um, through the um, light bulbs going off of business, doing business for the kingdom, we started seeing that, um, I think it was Mission Advance, or I think it was Mission Advance, um, we started seeing the amount of resources that are trapped, not trapped, but are, exist inside of a company. And we were able to, you know, just some quick math, I think that was a three-year campaign, and we said, hey, if we give like two grand a month out of our businesses, we're, we're giving, you know, like $75,000 with a pretty simple lift out of our business. Like a couple grand a month for most businesses is not that hard. You, if you've got decent cash flow, if you've got you know, a, a semi-healthy business, you can carve that out. We said, wow, there's a lot of resources inside of, inside of our business. So we got a passion for starting businesses for the kingdom and seeing people do business for the kingdom. And so I sold one of my companies a year and a half ago, and God gave me this idea for a new company called Sparrow. Sparrow is S-P-E-I-R-O, and it's Greek for to sow or scatter or plant seed. Okay? And so... The, the, and this is kind of rooted in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15, which has this, all this agricultural uh, uh, imagery and seed imagery. And Sparrow is all about uh, equipping and training other business owners to do business for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So we've got a podcast, we've got content, we've got a blog, and, and my son and I, Caleb's in there, he's committed his business to the kingdom. And um, so we, are, we are, spend our time and energy promoting people to be generous and to get in the fight with your wallet, to get in the fight, get your family involved with your wallets, and, the, and get your business involved. So Sparrow is all about doing business for the kingdom, training men to do that, and then planting our own businesses for uh, the ability to be generous for situations like this, so that when the time has come and, and we're tapped to be generous, we have businesses that have been built to give to the kingdom for these reasons. Yep. And I, I'm going to have... Ha, have Jeff share more about Sparrow in the, in the days and weeks to come. You have a website and a podcast these guys could listen to? Yeah, so, so part of Sparrow is mentorship because we want to train guys to do business for the kingdom to be generous. And so we've got a website. It's gosparrow.com, G-O-S-P-E-I-R-O.com. And then our, our, our podcast is Vertical Business, Vertical being Vertical with the Lord. Um, and, and Vertical Business, uh, we've got a podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and, and uh, Google Podcasts. So... Uh, we try to put content out that's helpful to business guys, helpful to the effort of, of doing business for the kingdom and making an impact with your business. Yep. And I'm going um, to... You can thank the Lord for that. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> uh, we had five or six guys who wanted to have up here uh, this morning, but just due to time, we couldn't get them up here. But, but these are the only two guys doing this. We have, we, have, we have dozens of men in our church who are thinking like this, living like this, and it's, it's remarkably exhilarating. Greg, talk to us about your journey in generosity and what God's been doing in your life and what you're doing right now to move the needle with your business and your uh, opportunities. Okay. So uh, growing up as a Christian, I'd realized that a lot of people had spiritual gifts. I was very frustrated for a big chunk of my life because I didn't recognize that I even had a gift, number one. Um, so Josh, I, I've been here about six, seven years now, and Josh actually helped me um, identify generosity as a spiritual gift, and which was great because it was very frustrating, my walk up to that point, not knowing what, 
What am I supposed to do? What, I, I'm not a good teacher, um, terrible in front of public. <laughs> um, just didn't know what I could do. And so growing up doing construction, um, as I identified that gift of generosity in me, I, I, start, I started to have you know, all kinds of prompts from the Holy Spirit of what, could, what I could do other than just my nine to five um, job. And so um, KBI is, a, is kind of a, an offshoot of one of the first things we did. Josh and I put that together um, and it's, it, the beauty of it is it's not just, it's not me. I'm just a tiny part of what KBI does. It's, it's God orchestrating a, an amazing team of guys. Um, I get to be part of it, which is really cool. It's a huge blessing, but it takes a, it takes an army of guys to pull that off. So that was kind of the beginning. Um, and for the new guys, KBI's Kingdom Builders Incorporated, a commercial construction company that's been building out phase three, finished phase two. And Kyle and I have estimated that, that you, you've saved the church just right under $2 million. Uh, if we've been working with... Uh, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, no, it's cool. Glad, super, super blessed to be a part of that. Um, one of the things we're doing that kind of links well with what I do um, in the excavation world is I've always wanted to get into development. And so Josh and I have gotten to know a few guys that um, we kind of cast a vision of what we wanted to do to help raise money for the church. Um, we've got a guy in our congregation that was like, yeah, I can get by in that. Um, I've got a million bucks for you at no interest to purchase the property, um, which kind of started a development in Cashmere that we're currently working on right now. Um, we've sold, I guess, half of the lots, so we're getting to that almost break-even point. So if anybody needs a building lot, we've got a hot deal for you out in Cashmere. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's developing and going. Um, and then off of that, um, we've got another guy involved now, and we've started a home, a separate home building company focused on building a home and a profit going back to the church. So. It's, it's a domino effect of, of things that can happen that God, you know, God continues to open doors and bring people um, through relationship into this bigger story that I couldn't do any of it by myself. I get to be a small part of it, which is really cool. Um, but it's not easy. So the spiritual attack side of what we're doing, it's like from the moment we declared, okay, Lord, we're going to buy property, for example, do a development. It's like the enemy was just waiting to start hacking at us with this baseball bat at the knees. It's like every, every step in the process has been challenging. Um, I guess I thought when we step forward to do this, it would just be this, you know, rolling out of the red carpet and a piece of cake. Well, it's been nothing like that. It's been super challenging, but it's been great because God wins every, everything. And so we will see a challenge and we're like dead end. We're never going to get around the same. Well, God opens a side door and we get around it. And so the way God weaves his story, this whole behind the enemy lines thing <clears throat> has never been more clear to me because it's real. Um, the enemy is like a roaring lion. That's no joke. <laughs> no joke. But God is so much so much better and so much uh, more powerful than our enemy. It's not even, it's not even close. And so we get to see that regularly. Um, but as you guys are considering, what, what could you do in your nine to five? What are you missing? What's right there in front of you that maybe you could pivot and do something different? It's like, I highly encourage you guys to do it because it's, it's, it's super rewarding. You feel like you're in the fight for God. But, like Josh was just saying on those 13 points, um, the enemy knows that chink in your armor. He knows what to go after. As soon as you declare uh, publicly or, or whoever with your, with your family, with your friends, the enemy is ready to take you down. And so those 13 points have never been more vivid and real, and it's, it's right on the money. So I encourage you guys to stretch yourselves and look at maybe different ways you could do things, but get your crap together along the way because yeah, it's, right. it's a battle behind enemy lines. It's a war for sure. Yep. So. Yep. 
So here's the, you can thank Greg, thank you, Greg. <laughs> yeah, you should grab these guys afterwards if you want, the, the, the different business models they've employed. I mean, you know, tech and, 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 and construction is really, really fun to watch. The vertical, vertical integration, like with what Greg and Travis are doing, uh, we're going to do together, super fun. At every point along the way, from investor to developer to builder, to a realtor involved. I mean, real, realtors are giving money back, investors are giving money back. You know, you and Travis set it up with Tove. It's like 60% goes back, the remaining gets paid taxes off and the seed money for next project. It's like large chunks of money going to the kingdom because that's where their heart is uh, at the expense of they could keep gold bars for themselves. So here's a story I, I want to share because any, anyone can do this. This is um, Keegan Bogan, Boger. And uh, he had an idea. He wanted to build leather covers for the axes that we gave out to Stronger Men last year and year before. And his dad said, sure. And so his dad started working there. He put together a business plan and, and, and what's the potential market and what's your expense and overhead and time outlay, all these kind of things. And his dad, like a good dad, helped him work out a business plan. And then he came to, to my brother, Kerry, and said, hey, could I, could I make covers with Stronger Man Nation logo on them so I can sell them at the conference and I could make some money? Um, and Carrie's like, well, yeah, but they can't look like garbage because we got a pretty high brand and we're pretty, you know, and he's like, oh, I'll do a good job and okay, we'll give you a shot, kid. And, uh, and so he says, well, I'd like to pay for the, 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 the brand, the logo. Carrie said, no, why don't you just, why don't you just give them, uh, some money back that you, that you make to, to Mancard? And so uh, that kid went and did that. And, and, and then what he made was that. Men, CYA, cover your axe. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That, now, how, how old is Keegan, Kerry? 14? I saw, I thought I saw Aaron Boger earlier. Somewhere up here, maybe. Yeah, For how old is Keegan? There's, wait, Keegan, wave your hand, buddy. Wait, higher. There it is. That, that's the man right there. That's what he did. Now, 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 now look at that. Now, you couldn't do that. If we gave you 10 years, if you gave me leather and tools in 10 years, I couldn't do that. I, I, I don't even understand. I can't. I, I don't know how that happened. Somehow, a cow became that. <laughs> that just blows my mind. It's, it's, look, look at the detail, you know, the over the thing and the button and the, and the stitching. And I mean, it's just incredible. And then let's go on the back side. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So, so. Here's the deal. I think he's got like 9 million of these for sale out in the lobby. How many did you make? He made 80. He made 80 of, the, he made 80 of those. What have you been doing with your life? I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. He made 80 of these, and he wants to sell them, and he's going to be given a portion of it to help fund man card that comes up in a couple weeks. And that, bro, is awesome. That is so awesome. You may not have a million bucks to, to, to give the God right now. You give what you can. You take what you can. The skill set God's giving you, the passion God's giving you. What, you love to do leather work? Awesome. Figure out how to make it work. This is where generosity starts. And I'm telling you, God will take that desire and heart of a 14-year-old, and God will bless it. He's going to give a couple bucks off 80 that he, that he sells here in the next five minutes, in the next couple weeks here. And I'm telling you, check back in with that guy in 20 years. Because what he'll have done for the kingdom will be significant. That's just how it works. That's how it works. So men, lead with generosity. Lead your family in generosity. And the question is, you know, gird up your loins, pray, lead, and give. That's how we're going to do battle. We're not going to sit around, not going to gripe, whine, complain. We're going to pray. We're going to lead as God's given us the ability to. And we're going to give. We're going to give time. We're going to give money. We're going to give resources. I wish I could tell you stories of how many people have come forward and signed up to do our legacy staff for the school. I, I don't want to tell you to discourage you from coming forward. We think we got too many. We, we could staff the school with volunteers right now. Yeah. Now, we're not going to because year to year that gets kind of complicated. <laughs> you need some continuity in the school. But, but I'm telling you, the people in this church are ready to lean in. You should be encouraged. You got to figure out what God's called you to give on your own individually and then when that collectively comes together, the impact is, I believe, going to be overwhelming. So we're going to gather again in November. And when we gather again uh, under Pastor Adam's teaching, we will know if we get to build a house for the family capital of the world, if we get to start the school. The school isn't a given. If we don't hit our number, we don't get to start the school because the school takes money. 
and we don't have it right now, we're stepping out in faith. And so we're going to know in a month if we get to charge the gates of hell and build the family capital of the world and start a school and plant John Lovell. And so I'm just speaking to you as plainly as I can. Sharon and I are asking God for the privilege of giving back to this church more than this church has paid us. That's what we're doing. And we're trying every means possible to get that done. I'm telling you, whatever you're dreaming, you can go bigger and then watch God provide. So it's going to take every man in the house acting like men to get us there. And if we don't get there, that's, that's, that's in the Lord's hands too. We're just picking the biggest target we can, run as hard as we can at it, and watch God provide. And if we die along the way, he's done us no wrong because he doesn't owe us anything to begin with, right? And so we're going to attempt to be men and see what God can, can do. So my charge to you men to lead your home, gird up your loins, and give what God has given you, no more and no less, and we'll watch and see what God does. And a month from now, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll know where we're going, and we'll know what we're going to get to do, and then we'll, we'll keep going from there. Any questions? Great. Let me pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, as we, as we move behind enemy lines, would you give us grace and power and insight to be vigilant watchmen over our homes, over our wives, over our children, and over our very souls. Would you give us a kind of holy zeal for your word and your glory that overshadows any desires of the flesh that would rise in our heart? Would you give us a, a holy hatred for gossip and slander and hearsay? Would you give us a holy zeal for believing the best and being unoffendable and forgiving other people when we're slighted and putting down our flesh and acting generously in all areas of our life with all things that you've given us. Lord, would you impart creativity to the men of this house with their port investment portfolios and with their checkbook that you would show them ways they could be generous and ways they could be wise with investments that they make so that we could be a kind of church led by the kind of men who put all the chips on the table, caring for their family, wisely preparing and investing for the future, and sacrificially sowing seeds into the kingdom of God right now. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity of building the family capital of the world, of expanding our ability to serve families and starting Garden City Academy for our children, for our children's children, and for our children's children's children. Thank you for the friendship with John Lovell and the ability to send him Chris and Renee and help them plant Grace City, Rome. We pray, Jesus, that your spirit would be over your people, over your church in this valley, and upon the men in this room as they go back out into their morning behind enemy lines to live fearlessly for the glory of God. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.